Uh, hello, everyone, um, and welcome to our panel discussion um, of Hannah Arendt's essay, We Refugees. Um, before I say much more, uh, I would like to hand to Pierre Thielberger, um, Executive Director of uh, the Institute for International Law of Peace and Armed Conflict, uh, the EFV in Bochum, uh, for a brief uh, introduction. Pierre, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Benedict. Can you all hear me? I, I think so. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, so uh, dear organizers, dear Benedict, dear Christian, uh, dear um, Cluster on Forced Migration and Vital Disruptions of EFV, dear uh, European Society uh, of International Law Interest Group on Human Rights, uh, thanks very much for uh, the introduction and for this uh, very uh, exciting uh, event. I'm really uh, very much looking forward and I know you had a lot of registration for, for this event, which uh, really doesn't surprise me because it's a great, great event and we have three really uh, distinguished speakers and I could hardly imagine anyone being more qualified and more interesting to talk about this. So I'm very excited. Uh, my role today is a lot less exciting because my role is uh, simply to give a very short introduction to Hannah Arendt and into her text, uh, We Refugees, and then I will really in five minutes maximum already hand over back to uh, Benedict. Mm, Hannah Arendt uh, was born 1906 in Hannover and she was an academic and a political publicist in the field of political theory. And today uh, she is probably one can say, uh, seen as one of the most influential political theorists of the 20th century. Between Past and Future is the title of one of uh, her more influential works, which I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with. And I think in many ways today, uh, we are also with exactly that topic today, with the past and with the future. Uh, today, we focus on her essay, We Refugees. And in this essay, she gives her account of what it meant to be a stateless and in many way, ways um, a rightless uh, Jewish immigrant in the 1940s. Uh, as probably uh, most of you know, uh, Hannah Arendt was forced to uh, emigrate from Germany uh, by the deprivation of her rights, by the persecution of a Jew. Uh, during the Nazi era, she was uh, imprisoned in the Gestapo in the 1930s. And then she first emigrated to France, where she worked in several uh, social projects, uh, Jewish uh, social projects. Um, and then um, she finally, after she was expatriated, I think in 1937 by the Nazis, she emigrated further to the United States in 1941. Uh, she was stateless for a long time uh, until she was granted US citizenship in 1951. And in 1975, she died in New York. So much about her life. Now, talking about uh, the text we are concerned with today, uh, as I said, uh, it can tell us a lot about the present and uh, uh, the past, but also the future. And I think what we try to do today, if I understand this event correctly, is that we want to discuss how different, benefit, uh, how different disciplines can benefit from uh, Arendt's writing uh, from 1943, and we will show uh, how much relevance this has until today. Uh, I don't need to remind you that forced migration remains one of the biggest contemporary challenges international relations uh, faces today. And I'd like to quote here for the first time from the text by Anna, Hannah Arendt that we are discussing today. She says in 1943, we lost our home, which means the familiarity of daily life. We lost our occupation, which means the confidence that we are of some use in this world. We lost our language, which means the naturalness of reactions, the simplicity of gestures, the unaffected expression of feelings. We left our relatives, that means the rupture of our private lives. Now, according to uh, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, global forced displacement has surpassed 80 million people last year. Over a third of them are uh, displaced abroad. The causes are manifold and range from fleeing armed conflict to political persecution. In 2019, almost two thirds of these refugees were from Syria. I'm sure you are aware that the Syrian conflict reaches its sad 10 year anniversary these days. Uh, many others are from South Sudan, Venezuela, uh, or Myanmar. In Hannah Arendt's words, back to 1943, if we are saved, we feel humiliated. And if we are helped, 
we feel degraded. As last year's events in Moria illustrated, the conditions for many forced migrants are dramatic and inhumane while seeking refuge. Being detained in provisional camps without adequate housing, without adequate water, without adequate food, without medical uh, provision, are very clear human rights violations. But even beyond such degrading conditions, the reduction to the status of a helpless refugee is one of the most serious problems. Forced migrants must become part of the conversation and we must understand them as relevant actors. Hannah Arendt writes again, the less we are free to decide who we are or to live as we like, the more we try to put up a front to hide the facts and to play a role. The events in Germany in 2015 and the so-called refugee crisis have shown a high degree of solidarity by some, but also a high degree of frightening intolerance by others. What always was considered unthinkable in Germany, given its history, moves bit by bit into the realm of reality. Rejection and one-sided expectations of society as a whole can have drastic effects on the psychological health being of refugees that goes for 1943, as it goes as the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees tells us also for today. And I quoted last time Hannah Arendt before I conclude, she writes, our identity is changed so frequently that nobody can find out who we actually are. Arendt's essay, and I wanna conclude with this, was published in the Jewish Menorah Journal in 1943 shortly after, as I said before, she migrated to the United States. And it was not translated, I find this really remarkable, into German until 1986. And it was not part, uh, definitely not of the German, probably not of the European uh, discourse uh, for such a long time. And I find it uh, even more relevant and important than we have this conversation now, uh, that this text uh, bridges uh, the gap between past, uh, present, and future. And we learned the lessons from this, uh, from this text that maybe we should have learned many decades ago. With that, I would hand back to Benedict and uh, I thank you very, very much for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Pierre, for your introduction. And uh, once again, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our panelists and welcome to uh, the attendees um, to our panel discussion of Hannah Arendt's essay, We Refugees. Um, we will now uh, show you a very brief excerpt from um, an interview of Hannah Arendt with Gunther Gauss uh, in German television, but with English subtitles from 1964 to sort of set the mood uh, for our discussion. Erlauben Sie mir eine letzte Frage. In einer Festrede auf Jaspers haben Sie gesagt, gewonnen wird die Humanität nie in der Einsamkeit und nie dadurch, dass einer sein Werk der Öffentlichkeit übergibt. Nur wer sein Leben und seine Person mit in das Wagnis der Öffentlichkeit nimmt, kann sie erreichen. Dieses Wagnis der Öffentlichkeit, ein Zitat von Jaspers wiederum nun, worin besteht es für Hannah Arendt? Nun, das Wagnis der Öffentlichkeit scheint mir klar zu sein. Man exponiert sich dem Lichte der Öffentlichkeit, und zwar als Person. Wenn ich auch der Meinung bin, dass äh, man nicht auf sich selbst reflektiert in der Öffentlichkeit erscheinen und handeln darf, so weiß ich doch, dass in jedem Handeln die Person, in einer Weise zum Ausdruck kommt, wie in keiner anderen im Handeln und Sprechen. Das Sprechen ist eine Form des Handelns. Wie in keiner anderen Tätigkeit. Also das ist das eine. Das zweite Wagnis ist, wir fangen etwas an, wir schlagen unseren Faden in ein Netz der Beziehungen. Was daraus wird, wissen wir nie. Wir sind alle darauf angewiesen, zu sagen, Herr, vergib Ihnen, was Sie tun, Sie wissen nicht, was Sie tun. Das gilt für alles Handeln, weil einfach ganz konkret, weil man es nicht wissen kann. 
Das ist ein Wagnis. Und nun würde ich sagen, abschließend, dass dies Wagnis nur möglich ist im Vertrauen auf die Menschen. Das heißt, da auf in irgendeinem schwer genau zu fassenden, grundsätzlichen Vertrauen in das Menschliche aller Menschen. Anders könnte man nicht. Okay, with these very important remarks, which I'm sure we'll keep uh, in our minds as we discuss, uh, we would like to begin our discussion uh, with our first guest. Our first guest is uh, Farah Al Faisal. Originally from Syria, Farah is a graduate of our NOAA Master Program on Humanitarian Action. Um, and for her master thesis entitled Refugee and Identity Reformation, she conducted research in the Spanish Basque country. The topic of her thesis is very personal, as she is currently awaiting a decision on her own asylum application, which she lodged with the Spanish authorities in February 2020. Today, Farah will share with us some insights from her research on refugee identities and her critique of the way the humanitarian system perceives refugees and thereby perpetuates the experiences Arendt described in We Refugees already in 1943. Farah, you have the floor. I forgot you have to unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, I would I want to start by repeating a quote that Professor Pierre uh, read to us earlier. If we are saved, we feel humiliated, and if we are helped, we feel degraded. Those are the words of Hannah Arendt in 1943. What strikes me the most as a humanitarian and as a refugee is that those words were written almost 80 years ago but are still applicable today. That even though refugees have raised this point of concern 80 years ago, we are still, a, we are still uh, as a humanitarian system, failing to find a solution to the refugee identity problem. Refugee studies up to date focus mainly on the physiological needs of refugees or on the psychological traumas that were caused prior to the arrival to a safe land. The asylum system in Europe, along with the UNHCR's program, programs on refugee aid, are built in a way that stems from paternalism and erases individuality. They are not flexible enough to tailor to the specific needs of a vast community coming from different nations, religions, cultures, backgrounds, languages, and careers. In an attempt to run away from this label, that imposes a specific social identity, a collective of Syrian refugees based in France started a social movement under the title Najin Lasna Lajiin, which translates to we're survivors, not refugees. This is a clear attempt to do the same thing that Arendt referred to when she said back then that refugees prefer to be uh, referred to as newcomers or migrants rather than the title refugee. And it's also an attempt to highlight that just by arriving to a safe land does not end the struggle of refugees as we are still fighting in a community that we're still fighting to survive in a community that alienates us and stigmatizes us. I use the word stigmatize here as a reference for the impact the word refugee carries on its bearers where they become socially rejected or isolated and could eventually become a target for harassment through the framing of refugees as a collective of people rather than a set of individuals. Another similarity is the curfew that Arendt referred to, which probably sounds ridiculous to us today. However, it's still happening today. To force a specific community to be in their houses at a specific hour is to frame them as a high-risk population. From 2016 to 2018, I was residing in Beirut, Lebanon, where this curfew was actually imposed on Syrians. Every day at 8 p.m., police officers would be in the streets checking IDs to make sure that no Syrian refugee, or as they like to call them, the internally displaced people, was out on the streets. With the refugee identity imposed on us, a part of our freedom to choose who we are is taken away. A new identity that is not chosen nor accepted by us is forced upon us. Hence, different people would react in different ways. 
Assimilation is one way of reaction where we forget our past culture and jump to grab onto the new host society's culture, leaving us lacking in belonging to both cultures, the home because we abandoned it and the host because we simply do not belong to it. Marginalization, where we reject both cultures, leave us feeling empty and lacking of, in belonging. Separation, where we reject our host culture and cling on to our home culture, leaves us feeling nostalgic and unable to move forward. Then comes the magical word integration, where we are supposed to identify with both cultures, belong to both, love and practice both, which sounds pretty good but it's a lot harder to practice than it, is, than it sounds. Um, integration can lead us to being viewed as people with a lack in loyalty. Every time we practice one culture, we are betraying the other. And also we are never fully understood by neither cultures. Also the previously mentioned stigma stands in the way of refugees uh, integrating in their new society. However, studies have shown that integration is the preferred acculturation method when it comes to two cultures meeting at first hand. So what is actually being done uh, as an example in Spain or in the Basque country where I am currently located to integrate refugees? Of course, there are language courses, there are housing aids, education for minors, uh, financial aid and medical access, which are all really great things. But what is taken in return from us? Our right to work, our right to move, our right to choose where to reside, where to study, when to go out, when to eat, and what to eat. This is the integration program that is set in, the, in Spain today. And that is one of the reasons that drove me to do my thesis in the Basque country. The fact that the Basques also seem to be a community struggling to highlight their identity. They're a community that is thriving in nationalism. So my study focused on understanding how does a strong uh, national identity in the host community affect the integration and the social identity of refugees. Upon other results, my research found that when refugees find a social group that is not based on nationality that they can integrate into, their uh, psychological well-being is enhanced. Also that regardless of all the social factors that could act as daily stressors to refugees, the asylum system is still the main reason for refugees failure uh, to integrate. As the long waiting periods it requires exasperates the stress and anxiety that asylum seekers might have due to previous experiences. Thus, I think that we as humanitarians are focusing mainly on the host societies and the states comfort and preference, which we excuse by stating that our main funding comes from governments, rather than realizing that our failure to protect humans is taking away years of their lives. Refugees do not only lose their country, their homes or their families, they also lose their culture, their education, some of their dignity, their hopes and their dreams. When years of their lives are spent in waiting for the asylum system or the UNHCR, depending on where they are located, decides if they deserve to practice some of their human rights or not. Finally, I want to agree with Arendt when she said that humans do not learn from history. For as much as we seem to be scared of our history repeating itself, we are still not doing the basic minimum to stop it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farah, for these uh, very open and personal words, which I'm sure will give us a lot to discuss um, and talk about. Um, our second guest, which we are um, happy to welcome today, is Saba Karim. Uh, she is a law lecturer with a PhD in genocide studies and prevention, and at the same time, a writer. She has authored two novels, Humera and Semi-Apes, and her upcoming work is a collection of poems scheduled for publication this year. She's currently pursuing a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at the University of Texas, 
Um, and Sabah is very fond of Hannah Arendt's work. And today she will map elements which Arendt raises in We Refugees on the plight of Yugoslavian refugee and asylum seekers in Dubravka Ugrezic's novel, The Ministry of Pain. Sarah, we are looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Benedict. Uh, hello, everyone. So what I have today is in my short presentation, hopefully, um, I'd like to map propositions onto uh, the experiences that other refugees and asylum seekers have undergone. Uh, we Refugees was written in 1943 and remains, I believe, um, the most powerful, concise rendition on the plight of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, today, a lengthy compendium of uh, books, fiction and nonfiction exists on the subject. And since my presentation is to be only for five minutes, I've chosen on, to focus on only one of the works out there, and that is Dubrovka Ugrezic's novel, uh, The Ministry of Pain, which was published in 2004. A quick summary is as follows. A professor of literature in University of Amsterdam, Tanya Lucic, is forced to flee her homeland in Yugoslavia, where war and conflicts rage. Uh, the novel begins in the aftermath of that escape. It is situated in Holland, and it appears that the students assigned to her are former Yugoslavian exiles too. They earn their income uh, working for a factory producing s and clothing called The Ministry, hence The Ministry of Pain, the title of the book. Tanya quickly perceives the futility of uh, teaching literature, and she switches to encouraging her students to indulge in Yugo nostalgia in her sessions, and that is fraught with controversy. So in a few words, Yugo Nostalgia is just basically trying to uh, remember and capture moments from the past. Uh, that's what she does by, by taking her students out to the cafe and having these sessions with them instead of actually giving them classroom lectures on literature. As it turns out, one student, Igor, is particularly not, particularly not happy about this. And according to Tanya, conspires with her supervisors at the university to oust her from her position. At the end of the novel, he confronts her and makes her reconsider her understanding of living in exile. I will get back to this a bit later because this is very interesting. As I said, what I'd like to focus on in our next session is to bring your, in our session is to bring your, your attention to how similar the struggle of all exiles of war and genocide are. I've rounded up my observations to seven intersecting points in these two works, that is We Refugees by Hannah Arendt and The Ministry of Pain um, by Ugrezic. Uh, I will go through them one by one. The primary one uh, is the omnipresent, uh, omnipresent struggle of wanting to fit in and be treated like an ordinary citizen in the host country. Arendt said, we did our best to prove to other people that we were just ordinary immigrants. In the Ministry of Pain, it is through the character of Igor that we find that we see the desire of wanting to fit in, rather than Tanya, the, the protagonist, uh, who uh, you know is trying to uh, emphasize on Yugo nostalgia. So Igor is all about uh, trying to change Tanya and make her understand that the people who've just come into the country want to adapt and adjust and they don't want to think, think about the past. And so he has this very detailed description of what you know him and he and the rest of the students feel about adapting to, to Holland. Um, second, there's a knowing loss of one's home, one's familiar surrounding, one's occupation, one's language. And on this last one specifically, that is on language, Arendt mentions losing the naturalness of reactions, the simplicity of gestures, the unaffected expressions of feeling. Dubravka also begins her novel with a problem of language. She speaks of a bastardized form of Croatian that attempted, that they all spoke, that attempted to unite people from all the warring units of Yugoslavia, hence Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia. She speaks about how gestures, grimaces, and, and intonations had to be included uh, in this dialect for people to understand each other while they were in exile in, in Holland. She speaks of the meaningless platitudes introduced into that language, forced upon everyone in order to gain the necessary distance from their pain, their past. And I think uh, we, we also know, those of us who've read Arendt's work, that Arendt talks a lot about um, the introduction or the importance or the presence of cliché uh, in, in the language used at the time, which sort of like distances a person from the emotions involved. Um, in addition, on the subject of loss, Arendt mentions the loss of relatives and friends, which means a rupture uh, of private lives. 
And similarly, Ugrezic uh, speaks about how this loss of close and loved ones signifies a loss of the sense of self. These beings with whom one could constantly reconstitute life and without them, how she and the other exiles felt they were thrown back on themselves. The third point is the need to forget the past, where the refugee or asylum seeker comes from. Arendt speaks about being told to forget, and, in, in, and, and I quote, forgetting quicker than anybody could ever imagine, unquote. The new country was to become a new home, and she recounts how after four weeks in France or six weeks in America, we pretended to be Frenchmen or Americans. For Ugresic, in the course of finding the common point that would give sense to that class of literature, which she transforms into a session of sharing experiences, she feels that since the exiles from Yugoslavia came from different parts with internal conflicts among them, uh, as a teacher, she could unite them on the common ground that they had all lost something. Tanya, the protagonist, sense, senses the inner fragmentation in her students, their rage, their stifled protest. She explains how all of them had been violated in one way or another and experienced humiliation, fear, and hopelessness learned what it means to be reduced to a number, a blood group, a pack. Tanya describes herself and her lot in exile as convalescence. And she also says that exile was a kind of a regression. Fourth, an interesting addition I thought that stood out for me in Ugrezic's The Ministry of Pain when talking about loss was her mention of being deprived of the right to remember. And I think that is very important to our discussion today. Through the mouthpiece of uh, Tanya, Ugrezic explains how with the disappearance of the country of Yugoslavia came the feeling that the, that the life lived in it must be erased. The politicians she quotes, uh, I quote rather from her book, um, uh, who came to power were not satisfied with power alone. They wanted their new countries to be populated by zombies. She says people with no memory. She mentions how they encourage people to renounce their former lives and forget them. That is including literature, movies, pop music. Yet what's also interesting are the fractures in terms of the different approaches and perspectives to living in exile. So uh, Ugrezic presents different people with different views about the adaptation or assimilation. Uh, the people living in exile are not a monolithic uh, lot. Igor, for instance, the student who rebels against her, against Tanya for her approach to teaching and closes her up in a room and assaults her, has this to say, your students are not like you. They love this country, flat, wet, nondescript as it is. Holland has one unique feature. It's a country of forgetting, a country without pain. People turn into amphibians here of their own accord. They turn, they turn the color of sand. They blend in and die out. They're all they care about. That's all they care about, dying out. The Dutch lowlands are one big blotter. It sucks up everything, memories, pain, all that crap. In other words, some are more resistant to the assimilation and some less. In the Ministry of Pain, Igor speaks fluent Dutch. And it is said that Dutch meant freedom to him, that his mother tongue had become a burden. Arendt too spoke about how those in exile are convinced after a year that they spoke English as well as their mother tongue. And after two years, they could swear solemnly that they spoke English better than any other language. Their German, she, has, she continues, was a language they hardly remembered. What I deem noteworthy, noteworthy is a series of work I came across a while ago, which uh, discussed how important it was to use a different language than one's mother tongue in discussing a problem, especially an emotional one as the, the, the other language that is a new language would be more permeable to cold reason over emotional outbursts and, outbursts and irrationality. And perhaps this explains the necessity experienced by people in exile to switch over to a different language as a way to suppress the past, to suppress the pain. Fifth, um, I have here the feeling of being a scapegoat for all the problems in the host country. Um, I think most of us are aware, especially today, about how the assimilation of refugees and asylum seekers is difficult and how it comes with a variety of social repercussions. One of them is uh, linked with the increased incidence of crime uh, in the host country. Um, Arendt says how she wished she could remind the citizens of her host country that 
um, I quote, once we were somebodies about whom people cared. We were loved by friends and even known by landlords as paying our rent regularly. Once we could buy our food and ride in the subway without being told we were undesirable. We have become a little hysterical since newspaper men started detecting and telling us publicly to stop being disagreeable when shopping for milk and bread, unquote. Dubravka Ugrezic um, discusses the accusations leveled at the refugees for the increase in crime rate in Amsterdam ever since the influx and lays out a series of pejorative words used to denote a lot. They are stigmatized, she says, as the beneficiaries of political asylum, refugees, foreigners, children of post-communism, the fallout of balkanization or savages. She adds, they drag their former country behind them like a train. People said that the Yugo Mafia was responsible for a third of the criminal activities in Amsterdam. The papers were full of its thefts, prostitute trafficking, black marketeering, murders and vendettas. Sixth, <clears throat> the fact that the movement of refugees and, and asylum seekers from their conflict ridden homeland to their host country is never seamless. They often have to enjoy living and testing living in other countries. And often they are turned down or asked to, to leave. Both Arendt and Ugrezic and, and Farah earlier in, in the conversation discuss this in, in their individual works. For Arendt, it's done through, she does it through the character of Mr. Kuhn, who will be discussed um, in, a, in a short while, uh, who she says is a uh, is 100%, 150% uh, German, a uh, German super patriot. He moves from Prague to Vienna because of the Nazi, take, Nazi takeover there in 1937, and eventually in Paris for the same reason. In her class, Tanya recounts similar experiences of her students, uh, where she says where, where one of her students during the, the classes on Yugo nostalgia recounts, well, I did not come straight here. This is what happened first or that. First they did this and went there and then came here to the Netherlands. She says, Exile narr uh, narratives are dateless. And this is again linked um, to the sense of disorientation and loss uh, as losing the notion of time, of being dateless, of having spent so much time adjusting to a new place in a space of merely waiting, coupled with the fact that there were no witnesses, no parents, no family and friends to testify to any of that, to corroborate this vertiginous um, 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 journey into exile. Uh, which means that they were thrown back on themselves. Um, and, and, and what she says, which I, I highlighted in my work was, we fled from wherever we could to wherever we could. Seven, and the last one, is the prevalence of suicide among exiles, which has been mentioned both by Arendt and Ugrezic. So Ugrezic, through Tanya's, uh, through the mouthpiece of Tanya, the main character in the novel, explains how refugees would drink themselves to death uh, that was the cheapest way, or take an overdose of drugs, or simply die of a broken heart, which came, which came out of un, untreated heart attacks and strokes that were common during the war. She mentions the hopelessness of people and one elderly Belgrade woman who slipped and fell just as a bus pulled up before a waiting crowd. The crowd stampeded onto the bus, trampling the body beneath her feet, their feet. The doctors managed to patch the woman up, but soon after she threw herself out of a fourth floor window. Aren too speaks about it in We Refugees. She refers to the odd optimistic speeches made by people who eventually resort to suicide and how this optimism is by itself suspect. Um, so these are my seven points and I feel, I feel there's more that can be said about the plight of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, for me, in addition to the anguish suffered by a refugee because of war, there's um, the loss of a routine of loved one of loved ones, it's um, also the fact of being uprooted from one's country and driven aimlessly outside, uh, beyond the lagoon of protection that attracts the psychological consequences Arendt and Dubrovka mentioned in their work. Um, as Hannah Arendt says, um, man is a social animal and life is not easy for him when social ties are cut off. Moral standards are much easier kept in the texture of a society. So I think these last two, two or three lines should give an indication of um, this complete sense of chaos and disorientation that is experienced by every refugee or asylum seeker. The moment he or she is faced with the prospect of um, not belonging to a country anymore. So there you go. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sabah, for this uh, very interesting and fascinating account uh, and this uh, example of what literature can tell us about uh, experiences and, and reality. Um, last but not least, uh, we are delighted to welcome Itam Aman, who in a way is responsible for our being here today because it was through his book, Humanity at Sea, that I found out about Hannah Arendt's essay um, we are discussing here today. Uh, Itama is a senior lecturer at the University of Haifa um, and does research in international law and political theory. In 2006, he published his book, Humanity at Sea, to great acclaim in the human rights community and beyond. And in the book, he conceives the theory of human rights as rights of encounter. And one of the central texts he engages with in the book is We Refugees. Um, Itama is going to focus today on Mr. Kohn uh, from the essay, and we are very much looking forward, Itama, to hearing your remarks. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, these two talks that uh, came uh, before me were uh, extremely fruitful, and I really hope that we will have um, time to discuss them. Really uh, fantastic and remarkable work. Um, today, I want to talk about some uh, new research that also uh, stems from We Were Refugees in some way. Uh, and I think, uh, to some extent, uh, the date that we are speaking in is um, felicitous in terms of talking about this research. Today is uh, the Jewish holiday of Purim, uh, in which it is customary to uh, wear costumes kind of like the Jewish Halloween. In the screen before you, you see a couple. Uh, the man, the woman, I don't know who, who she is, but the man is uh, Walter uh, Benjamin. Um, and this is a photograph that I found on Samantha Rose Hill, uh, Hill's uh, Twitter feed. Um, I think it says that they're celebrating a certain carnival. I think uh, it's probably uh, the carnival that uh, is celebrated today. However, um, as might be uh, well expected, it's not this carnival that I want to talk about. I want to talk about uh, the practice of wearing a costume or the practice of disguise as it appears in the essay and its political meaning and ultimately also its legal significance as a certain tactic that emerges against the backdrop of certain limitations and characteristics of the international law controlling who gets to be defined as a refugee. And um, the starting point, as uh, Benedict kindly already indicated, is uh, the character of Mr. Cohn. So I'd like to read just a uh, short part of a paragraph in which Arendt uh, discusses uh, Mr. Cohn. Um, although um, I think Sabah and uh, others have already kind of referred to him. Someday somebody will write the true story of this Jewish immigration from Germany. And we, he will have to start with a descriptive, ascription, sorry, of that Mr. Cohn from Berlin, who had always been 150% German, a German super patriot. In 1933, that Mr. Cohn found refuge in, pra in Prague and very quickly became a, conv uh, a convinced Czech patriot as true and loyal as Czech patriot as he had been a German one. Our own Mr. Cohn then went to Vienna to adjust oneself there. A definite Austral Austrian patriotism was required. And of course, he also moved to Paris later on. And in every place where he arrives, he takes on the kind of external trappings of citizenship. He tries to be a citizenship by adopting first and foremost the culture. This is a certain idea of uh, political membership as constituted by, by being a member in society, by being a member um, of a culture, by belonging in, certain, in a certain performative way. And of course, everywhere he discovers that this will not work, that a citizenship um, is a, a formal status um, of membership that is not simply given to those who can perform it, but also has a deep national root um, that, that uh, exposes Mr. Cohn, and of course, by reference, Arendt herself and her generation to um, uh, the most dangerous and deplorable forms of uh, degradation. 
So we have here a certain idea of the citizenship as a mask, the citizenship as something that comes from um, the outside. And um, we, we see this through the biographical lens in some, to some extent of Arendt herself. But elsewhere in her scholarship, there's a very different idea of citizenship that also gets the form of a mask. And this is a positive form, rather, um, where the first story that I told um, is kind of a negative story. This appears in On Revolution. And I'd like to also read uh, the relevant part where Arendt talks about uh, the Roman mask. We see here a mask from uh, a Roman comedy of the second century as a paradigm for the equalizing and public nature of citizenship. The profound meaningfulness inherent in the many political metaphors derived from the theater is perhaps best illustrated by the history of the Latin word persona. In its original meaning, it signified the mask ancient actors used to wear in a play. The mask as such obviously had two functions. It had to hide or rather to replace the actor's own face and countenance, but in a way that would make it possible for the voice to sound through. And you see uh, the hollow part uh, where the voice uh, comes through uh, in this screen. At any rate, it was in this twofold understanding of a mask through which a voice sounds that the word persona became a metaphor and was carried from the language of the theater into legal terminology. The distinction between private individual in Rome and a Roman citizen was that, was that the, the latter had a persona, a legal personality, as we would say. It was as though the law had affixed to him the part he was expected to play on the public scene. So in other words, citizenship is a mask because it allows us to keep away certain private characteristics of our, per our personality when we come to the public realm and where, where we are equalized. We don't have different colors uh, and we don't have um, different, uh, even the material conditions through which we live are kind of um, occluded and we have essentially something like an equal voice. And this is very much associated, I believe, in On Revolution with Arendt's somewhat idealized vision of what it meant to have citizenship in the United States. So to recap recapitulate uh, the kind of juxtaposition here, we have a mask of citizenship through culture that is failing, and we have a mask that eliminates culture in a way to um, eliminate it from the public sphere and have a sphere of Republican equality. Now, in my own research, um, starting from around 2010, I found um, that the disguise is actually a very kind of uh, fruitful and uh, common characteristic of refugee struggles or migrant struggles in many cases. And a particularly apt moment to describe here was a moment in 2010, I was working on this Human Rights Watch, Human Rights Watch report here that you see uh, from uh, the Evros region, which is on the border between Greece and Turkey, the land border. And we were interviewing many uh, migrants and refugees from many different countries in the world, mostly from the Middle East and also from uh, Africa, East Africa, various places. And uh, one day we saw a group crossing the border in what one uh, might, um, the, the, the clothes that one might associate with a relatively uh, conservative Muslim identity. And they were refusing to speak. Um, and then they spoke with us. We saw them kind of on the side of the road and we stopped the car and talked to them. They said that they were coming from Somalia. Um, and so this seemed kind of strange in terms of how they behaved, but um, it was their claim that they are kind of Muslims from Somalia, which was back then an identity that was protected because of um, kind of collective protection order that was that applied to Somalia. Later, we saw them in um, the uh, police station in Fares, which is a small village on, in the Greek-Turkish border. 
and uh, the Greek police told us that in fact they they came from the Dominican Republic. So apparently they flew from uh, uh, Latin America to Turkey and tried to enter Greece dressed as Somalis. And this was very, very strange. But I think that there is a certain inter interpretation here that Arendt allows us to see, which um, makes, makes this moment an indicative moment in terms of the structure of refugee protection and migrant struggles today. Today, I would like to argue there is another mask that oftentimes refugees and migrants use. It's the mask not of citizenship, but, hu but of humanity. Under a regime of human rights law, certain forms of citizenship are less valuable to those that have them from the mere presence as a human being within the jurisdiction of a country that purports to protect basic human rights. And so it, would be, it, it, it becomes the kind of exercise not to shed one's uh, citizenship to become a citizenship in a Republican equal context, but to shed one's citizenship in order to take on instead the costume of what it means to be a human that is protected as such. And in the cultural imagination that is active in the context of refugee protection, that is often associated with particular countries. When we were in Greece, for example, it was for Somalis, for Palestinians, and for Afghans that were, for some reason, not it was not possible for Greece to return them home. They had a form of collective protection, or simply the states where they came from would not accept them back. But in any case, they fit now into a category of mere humans. And so in this context, we can see, uh, for example, this the caricature um, from 2015 uh, depicting Tony Abbott and what seems to be a Hazara refugee um, in um, confronting Australia. And um, we see the practice of lip sewing, which is also quite prevalent in many uh, detention camps around the world. And I would like to argue that this lip sewing is diametrically opposed to the voice, the hollow area that we saw uh, in the Roman mask and the way that Hannah Arendt interpreted it. In other words, here, the idea is not to be, not to appear in the public sphere as a voice, as a political actor, as a member, but rather to simply state the fact that the body is present and the body itself becomes an agent of certain protections in a regime of human rights law that works under an idea of jurisdiction under, uh, as effective control. In the contemporary context, there is, I would like to also um, conclude with these remarks, a certain dialectic dynamic between these two forms of protection. For some, citizenship is, more, is the more valuable category. And then um, there's a struggle to assume certain forms of citizenship and participation in order to obtain a thick protection for a various, um, for a panoply of human rights. For others, typically people from uh, the developing, the so-called developing world, the citizenship is a form of exclusion, essentially, tying these people to particular territories where they cannot have any effective control whatsoever. And then humanity, though so thin it's in its protections, becomes the option to fall back on. And both these categories kind of press against each other and have a certain interaction in um, the much wider um, dynamics of contemporary global displacement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Itama, for this uh, fascinating account of, of and this 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 very um, interesting description of how a mask can be a hindrance um, and an enabler um, at the same time, and how uh, how we can see this um, in current in current practice um, at the borders um, <clears throat> in the European Union, but also elsewhere. Um, I would like to uh, get into a discussion now with um, the panelists. I think we have uh, heard three uh, very, very interesting accounts, uh, very fascinating accounts, um, and I am sure um, that there is that there is a lot 
uh, that we can talk about. Um, so um, if anybody wants of you who wants to take the floor now and wants to react to something that was said, um, I'd be very happy uh, to continue the discussion. Okay, can I start? Of course, Farah. <laughs> okay, I have a question for Sabah and a question for Itamar. Um, Sabah, you mentioned something which uh, also uh, grabbed my attention when I was reading We Refugees. Um, she talked about refugees committing suicide and how the suicidal rates are worth mentioning, at least. I actually went on a research to find if that is still applicable today, and it was to my very short and little research, apparently refugees do not have a difference of a suicidal rate. But from personal experience, um, I would say that a lot of us have lost the fear of death, not just towards ourselves, but also towards other people. For example, a lot of the Syrian detainees, when we get the news that one of them has passed, I think the first thought that crosses our mind and is something that I've uh, often heard is, uh, well, at least he's not suffering anymore, which shows or which tells me somehow that we as refugees, due to the horrors that we are aware are happening back at home, we kind of lost the fear of death. Do you think that counts as what they were talking about when they were referring to suicide? I think I think uh, this um, in terms of like not fearing death anymore from what I've read and the books on fiction and, and nonfiction I've read on the subject. Um, that's what Hannah Arendt also mentions in her We Refugees. She talks about, you know, how one stops caring about um, whether it means anything to be alive or dead. I mean, that's in, in the general highlights, the broad highlights of what she talks about. And I think when I was reading a lot of um, the fiction works on this subject, um, I felt that this was um, the general feeling out there. So I'm a little bit surprised, to be honest, when you say that according to the research you've done, there isn't um, any sort of like, uh, you know, uh, obvious uh, change in statistics in terms of the suicide rate. I think um, every author, I mean, without fail, every author I've come across so far uh, has talked about the prevalence uh, of suicide. Um, and especially, I think what what marks me a lot is the fact, and, and it's reflected in Hannah Arendt's We Refugees as well, where, you know, the approach to, to discussing the suicide of a person in that kind of situation is so different from, uh, let's say, a, 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 a Hollywood figure or any other figure committing suicide. Um, it's treated with a kind of a disconnection, dispassion, where it's treated as um, there's a certain resignation to, to, to hearing about suicide because everybody knows, everybody means those in exile, knows or shares that sort of like depression or feeling of, of um, dejection um, and, and can relate to the experience of suicide. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but I really feel that, I, I find it very hard to, 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 to imagine that um, you know, um, suicide is not uh, discussed widely. I mean, the, the other fact is, uh, if you're going to, if, if these people are going to experience depression, with clinical depression, which is a normal part of the experience of a refugee or an asylum seeker, then obviously there are going to be cases of, 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 of suicide. So I don't see how these can be disconnected. Thank you. Um, my next question, uh, Itamar. Um, you mentioned something that it, where you said that you found it strange that some refugees were dressed as uh, another nationality to pass the border. Can you elaborate on why is that strange considering, um, well, the current situation where to claim asylum, you, you have to tick a lot of boxes and specific nationalities are more preferred than others? You know, I, I don't think it's strange at all, frankly speaking. I, I think it's um, very understandable. Um, I, my my uh, intervention was rather different, trying to understand what are the conditions that makes that such um, a regular uh, form of action? What are the underlying conditions? And I think the underlying conditions are essentially a combination of the fact that the Refugee Convention protects 
uh, people based on a limited set of factors, politic, politics, race, ethnicity, religion, and a particular social group. And then that there is collective protection for particular nationalities uh, that are recognized as places of kind of generalized violence. And then there's enormous category, perhaps the greatest category of people who are in dire need or not protected by either of these frameworks. And therefore they are pushed towards um, kind of shedding their nationality, as I said, and adopting not any nationality, but particular nationalities that the international framework as they stand give a certain preference to. So the attempt is to basically explain that. I think it's not strange and I think it was common to every generation of refugees across history in the 20th century at least. At least. And I have to say just one more thing is that I encountered this very early on in my work with refugees um, and there is a constant kind of gamesmanship between both the, the, the refugee and the authorities with, with the authorities trying to box the refugees into particular nationalities as well. And they're also yeah. um, invo you know, um, practicing their own lies when they're doing that. So it's not like there is one side that is telling the truth and another side that is lying or pretending or something like that. It's a game of lies from both sides. And in both sides, it's conditioned by particular rules of international law that suggest that kind of game. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if uh, you allow me one question, um, I would uh, actually um, like to talk a little bit about the very last part of, ha of, Arendt's, um, of Arendt's essay. Um, and that is this sort of radical transition of where she where she switches from observation um, to 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 making propositions to to suggesting um, an approach um, for for her um, for her community uh, to deal um, with with the problems that they experience and to um, deal with their situation in a way that would enable them um, to to live their identity to be open about it and therefore. Um, to connect history um, and the present. Um, and I was wondering um, what you were thinking about this proposition. Um, what, whether um, Sabah, um, for example, there, there are similar, there is a similar sort of turn or similar outcome, or maybe a very different one um, at the end of Ugrezic's novel, or maybe not at all. Maybe it leaves open this, this question of how to deal with this. Um, but nevertheless, I find this a very interesting passage or very interesting part of the of the of the essay um, and also quite a powerful note to end on um, after all that Arendt describes um, so I was wondering um, what what you uh, think about this um, whether you think it's something that uh, that that is indeed a solution um, and whether we see that uh, in other works as well um, I I think uh... In terms of like proposing solutions, and I think that applies to every subject out there, um, I think it's very difficult for us to come up with a concrete set of solutions to any kind of problem. Um, what surprises me and Farah, because, and, and this is also my question to you, um, I'm, I'm very interested in your status as, as a refugee in terms of like what have been the subjective aspects of what you went through, which were not included in, in We Refugees. Um, sorry, Benedict, I'm getting back to what you said as well. But I want to, I definitely want to touch on that because I am just an academic and uh, I am sort of like distanced from the actual experience. And I think what we all love, or I hope we all love this about Hannah Arendt is the fact that she manages so beautifully to marry academia and her own subjective experience, which makes her writing so powerful. So I would like to, to hear from Farah, first of all, um, what she feels about the, the, um, uh, the, the obstacles, the impediments that, that she has had to face as, as a refugee, which she did not see mentioned in Hannah Arendt's We Refugees, and even in my presentation, where I talked about some of how this is like reflected in, in fiction work, that's one. And second, back to what Benedict said, and also what Farah said in her presentation is like, 
Farah said um, she doesn't feel, and, and correct me if I'm not mistaken, she doesn't feel that we've moved much from this uh, piece of writing, from, from what Hannah and described then. Um, I like to think, and again, I am just an academic. Um, I like to think that we have moved a little bit from that sort of situation where there are some sort of like, um, you know, benefits or, or um, ameliorations uh, made to the refugee and asylum seeker status uh, in some countries, because I, I know that it's, it's not a, a, a blanket rule in all the countries, but I would like to think it's a little bit better. And I'm not saying that a little better is good, but better is good. So we should just be hoping that it gets better. And again, what is very poignant is the fact that when I read out, uh, when, I, when, I, when I had my presentation earlier, I said that exiles have different, people living in exile have different approaches to, to how they want to, to deal with the assimilation process. For example, the main character, Tanya, uh, in the novel was very resistant to it. And it's not an age factor, by the way, she, although she's a teacher because there's a very small age difference between her and the students, and that's very interesting. Um, the students, however, most of them, Igor, they are very keen on adapting. They're very keen on forgetting the past and moving on. Um, and that also reminds me of, of, of Susan Sontag's uh, book. I don't know if you, you've been reading her work as well, where she talks about uh, how America is a place of forgetting because everybody who's come here doesn't give a damn about history because they want to erase that part of their past and start anew. So there is a problem with recollection, with memory and all of that. So there you go. In terms of solution, just to like end on what, uh, just to touch on, on, on what uh, Benedict asked just now, um, I don't think there are solutions uh, which are, which should be like, you know, um, uh, hard and fast in terms of like uh, the way we would we would approach the problem. I think it really depends on the the, the subjective uh, personality, the individual in question, and the country in which he or she is. So there are lots of questions here. Um, and yes, I would love to hear from Farah before. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Sabah. Uh, just um, before before you answer, Farah, which uh, I, by the way, am also very keen uh, to hear, it is it is interesting that you, Farah, say that nothing has changed and that you, Sabah, say, says, uh, say something has changed, but not a lot has changed. Because after 1943, we actually saw the introduction of the refugee system that we have today, of the Geneva Refugee Convention, of all the human rights instruments um, that govern that govern um, forced migration, and still uh, we ha we have to such we have to come to such rather bitter conclusions today, which uh, is I think uh, I think one one remarkable fact uh, about reading Arendt's essay uh, today. Um, <clears throat> uh, I want to comment on the change first. <laughs> Uh, definitely, there has been a lot of changes ever since 1943 until today. However, we managed to land in the same spot, I think. So we've been through ups and downs where the uh, 1951 Refugee Convention, for example, uh, happened. That was a step forward. And then on top of that, we built the 1969 uh, Protocol, which was also a very big step for the refugees uh, internationally. Uh, but we still managed after that to go back to uh, 1943, where We Refugees was written, and to still find that exactly what was said yesterday is, is implemented today. And that's what I mean, that definitely there has been a lot of change. And, but whatever the change was, it didn't target, or nor did it um, solve the problem of the refugee identity, which I think uh, what Hannah was trying to say in her uh, paper and what I'm discussing today is that regardless of all the physiological needs and regardless of um, maybe how the asylum system has developed, the refugee identity is still a massive struggle that we all go through, uh, which is why we are all trying to find different names for it. Uh, for her, it was the newcomers and the migrants. For us today, it's we're, we're internationally trying to stop using the word immigrant and replace it with migrant. And refugee, we're, we're trying to replace it with survivors. So there is still this huge stigma that I believe didn't, is, is not as old as uh, the stigma that uh, Alan was talking about. Because uh, through history, if we were to go back to after uh, 1951, where the Refugee Convention took place, 
I believe, according to a lot of research and a lot of papers that I have read, um, that refugees at a certain point in history were viewed as heroes after the Second World War. Uh, people admired them. They resembled people who stood up and fought for their freedom. So in a, in a specific point in history, refugee was not a stigmatized label. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say, and I hope I'm, I'm uh, making my point clear, is that where we started and where we ended is identical, regardless of what happened in the middle. Um, regarding my, my own personal experience, um, I don't believe that in today's world we have the access or the privilege to forget. Uh, one, because the, the society around us does not allow us to. And even though, for example, in the streets here, I do not practice my, my uh, language, which is Arabic, as there's no one around me that speaks it or understands it. And I generally speak in English. Um, I still got uh, harassed in the streets, uh, asked to go home because I'm speaking English. Um, people avoiding me on the metro, if I pick up the phone and speak in English, everybody stares at me as if I'm speaking a language that is out of the world. Uh, so I believe that society does not allow us to forget that's first. And second, I'm not allowed to forget when uh, I'm still dealing with the after aftermath of what, what I'm going through. For example, only uh, in August did I manage to get my work permit from the Spanish government, which was not even a paper. It was just that you're allowed to work. But then when I had to go to apply for a job and they would ask for the paper, I do not have a proof that I'm allowed to work. I just have a piece of paper that is that my picture is stapled on it. So when I'm carrying this paper all around uh, through, through the city for two years or even three years now with COVID, I cannot possibly forget. And um, another thing that I wanted to say is even if all of that is, is not as difficult as it is, I think with all the media exposure that we have, it makes it a bit harder to forget uh, where we come from or um, what's going on back there. And especially that we, I think in the global South are um, a community-based society, which means that we are very much in contact with our families, our cousins, our extended relatives, our neighbors, our high school friends, our primary school friends. So the fact that not all of us managed to escape and be outside and be safe, that stands in a way of, uh, of our forgetfulness, if, you, if I want to call it that. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, did I? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, this, is, this is absolutely touching and brilliant. And I think we need to be able to incorporate all of this. Um, you should do another piece like what Hannah then did in terms like of talking about these problems. And I think that's what we need to talk about concretely because I think dawdling in all the theory behind it and just sticking to the theory adds a certain dispassionate uh, you know, approach to, to, to academia, which we should try to avoid if we've actually been part of the whole process. So I think this is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think so too. It's it's really uh, brilliant, fascinating, and very interesting. Thank you very much for your open words. Uh, while while listening to you, I I was thinking, um, in connection with what what with what we've discussed before, our, our observation that after 1943, all these human rights instruments came into play, and 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 international governance as we know it today, uh, unfolded or or was created uh, better. Um, Maybe uh, a lot of the problems that Arendt describes uh, and that that you experienced uh, yourself, Farah, uh, and that that a lot of your, your other members of your community experience uh, every day, um, can they even be be addressed by international governance? Can they even be addressed by international law? By by, pol by politics, or isn't it is it something that must be sort of addressed by? Um, those communities which are affected by it and the host communities together with one another. What would be your take on this? Uh, well, I believe that, um, I don't know if that's gonna sound a little dreamy and uh, not very realistic, but I believe that we need to invest a lot in the host communities. 
So instead of only focusing our energy and our uh, resources on aiding the refugees uh, for their physical needs or for their basic needs, I think we should all, we need also to work on the host community. And um, one, one attempt that the UNHCR started in the Basque country was to have a community um, in the Basque country to receive families, Syrian families. So for example, when they have uh, an old woman, she would be a volunteer and the apartment next to her is empty. They would rent this apartment for the family arriving to the Basque country, allowing them to arrive to be neighboring a person who is volunteering to aid them and to guide them through their life rather than to be in a housing system where they everything every part of their life is is controlled uh, and according to the interviews and i actually met the refugees that were uh, a part of this program and they seem to be very happy way more uh, their integration or their start of uh, life in the Basque country went smoother than other refugees that I've also worked with in an integration center. Uh, however, sadly, the UNHCR only managed to get 32 families, which is not even a number worth mentioning. Uh, not because they are not as valid as a million, but because there are so, there, there's a huge need and we're not even scratching the surface with a number as close to uh, 32. But I believe that the solution will, has, will have to come from the host society and rather than by just forcing refugees to learn languages, uh, do courses, work on yourself, develop yourself. Uh, you're, there's, there's so much restriction on refugees while there is nothing that we are even tackling when it comes to the host society. They're not even aware what's the difference between a migrant, an immigrant, a refugee, an asylum seeker, an internally displaced person. They, they see us all as one community that they refer to as migrants or as refugees, depending on what's the trendy word in the news today. Thank you. Um, Itama, you as a, as a legal theorist and as a, as a legal practitioner with your work in the Global Legal Action Network, what, are, what, is, your, what is your take on this? Do you think that, that international law, law, governance, politics, are these even, these even means with which we could uh, ultimately tackle the issues that we've identified today? I think this is the discussion that we're having um, very uh, kind of intensively in our legal community. Uh, and uh, I think it relates to some extent to your um, former question about the ending of uh, we refugees. Because the ending of we refugees gestures towards an identity that is not recognized within the structure of the international community as it stands in the mid 20th century where citizenship um, and sovereignty basically is the sole um, legal foundation for rights. And so if that is the case, um, you know, the, the problem of people who do not have that foundation is not solvable perhaps. Now the human rights um, revolution, sometimes people say, tried to create a, a place for that uh, person who is not um, supported by the foundation of citizenship or sovereignty. Uh, however, um, as I tried to show in my talk as well, that has created all kinds of very, very strange incentives and uh, dynamics because um, the human rights, in order to do that, the human rights revolution also had to bifurcate uh, those basic rights from material protections that people also need in order to live uh, and therefore protects people only in the very, in, in the most radical, uh, the perceived to be most radical situations without inc uh, including situation of dire poverty or deprivation. And if that is the case, if, the, if, if there is no ability to consolidate or to kind of cabin a protection for humans that does not include um, the entire set of protections, including material protections, that leads us to the position of open borders and no borders, which is the more radical position within the movement, which says, no, we cannot um, solve this problem within the existing, existing structure, and we need to overthrow the structure entirely. As for my own position, um, 
I don't, uh, my, my legal practice is not intended at this point at least to overthrow the structure entirely. What I rather prefer to try to do is struggle within the structure and uh, find opportunities to bite away um, additional areas of freedom and protection for um, you know, uh, universal um, values or not values, but, uh, but universally and collective freedoms and protections for everyone. But that's not possible within the existing structure. So there is a kind of recognition that that will only be a struggle that will fail in many cases, but also maybe have limited uh, successes in some cases, which are still very valuable. Thank you very much, Itama. I also uh, had a question for Farah, if I, if I can. I don't know absolutely. if I'm allowed to. Absolutely. I, I also very much enjoyed your talk and was taken by um, the perspective that you brought to the table. Uh, particularly, I was uh, very, very intrigued by your use of um, the kind of um, identity of a refugee at the uh, while at the same time, the identity of a humanitarian. So you spoke about yourself as a refugee, but you also spoke about yourself as a humanitarian. And I think this is you know, um, something that I have encountered in the past, kind of refugee activism for refugees, but I was wondering if you can expand a little bit more about that. What does it, um, how does refugee humanitarianism differ from the perhaps more familiar, um, well-intentioned um, global North humanitarianism? Um, well, actually, um, I, I, I can you hear me clearly because I just disconnected my uh, headphones. Okay. Um, something that I am a little not proud about was uh, I've been a humanitarian or I've been in the hum working in the humanitarian field since 2016, which is adds up to five years to, uh, as of today. But um, I've only been an asylum seeker for a year. Um, and when I actually decided that now was the time, I don't have any other way to survive uh, here other than to claim asylum, I realized that I have this very big fear inside of me to change my title from a Syrian student in Europe to a refugee. And I was surprised that I was feeling this way, even though I am a humanitarian and I am aware that the stigma is invalid. But even myself, I struggled with it. Um, what I can, what's different or what I would say different uh, between me or anybody uh, who is a humanitarian from the global north, um, I think that I have some benefits and they have others, which uh, are two things that I faced throughout my, when I was carrying my uh, thesis, my master thesis here. One of them was how easy I could talk to other refugees, how easy they were willing to um, work with me, open up, share, and be honest about what I'm asking. And the other thing was how careful were the Basque that I interviewed when I was talking to them or asking them about their opinions about migration or refugees or uh, et cetera. So I think that we are both needed, definitely. And we both have uh, different perspectives and different, we bring different things to the table. Uh, I can bring something that is, uh, stems from my personal experience and my personal understanding uh, to the global South as being a person who is from there and who has been living with this situation probably ever since I was born because I was born into Palestine in the situation that it is today. So I was born aware of these things happening all around me than someone who uh, probably studied it from a different angle and came to learn about it from a different perspective. So I think that's mainly the big difference or the difference. I, I can say that um, we, in, in, um, we had a course in uh, my school where we uh, went to Greece uh, with students and many of our students are Palestinians um, and uh, we uh, did work with refugees uh, on Chios Island. And um, I also was there with them. And um, sometimes I use the word um, refugee, uh, asking people, you know, why do you believe that you are a refugee? 
uh, allergy. And I was immediately uh, corrected. You know, don't say to a person that he's a Lazia, a refugee. Uh, always use the term uh, searcher of an international of international protection. So fetish on Himaya Dolia instead of of refugee because that's um, degrading. And I also thought about uh, Arendt's uh, essay in this in this context. And so I, I was very uh, taken by this. Uh, survivors. As you know, the survivors also has a very, very long and fraught um, history in um, the human rights movement. And it's oftentimes associated with attempts to criminalize human rights violations and use particularly the form of a trial against um, violators um, and put people in jail, etc. I'm wondering if that too is part of the reason why you think the word survivors is the appropriate one or how do you understand it if i may i mean i i'm uh... um well actually the the um, the community that i refer to uh are specifically talking about the syrian refugees who are now in europe who have escaped syrian prisons so uh, but they also want to replace the word a refugee to the word survivor um I don't think that it's a, it's an umbrella term. We we cannot put every refugee under the term survivor because a lot of us yes have definitely faced persecution, but a lot of us are also in refuge because of the situation in our country which we cannot access anymore. Um, I'm not sure if, if there is a right term uh, other than the term refugee, which is what we actually are. But at the same time, I don't think that this is a title because a, a person or a student or a worker who has a working visa or a student visa, we don't refer to them as the students over there or the workers over there. We refer to them as their occupation, as who they are, as what are they bringing to their life, you know, the whatever they're special about them. But however, refugees are everything about them is taken away and just their act of refuge is highlighted in everything that they do. So I, I think we need to focus on just not giving so much attention to, to the legal status that I'm having rather than who I actually am. And not to have this um, big general term that includes everybody into it and defines specific things that are not really available or real or um, present for every refugee. Thank you very much. Uh, I, we are already over time, but with your permission, uh, we would uh, we would um, uh, invite those who have raised their hands um, to to briefly ask their questions. Um, and I would, uh, in the yeah, in the interest of time, really ask for brief questions uh, and brief brief answers. But it's a fascinating discussion, and if you allow, we could continue it for a couple of more minutes. Okay, the first question then is uh, Lin Al Faisal, which uh, I think already has permission to speak. Yes, I do. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for all of your insights. I've really enjoyed the discussion and I really appreciate the different approaches that I heard based on your different expertise. And I just wanted to say that I don't mean for my question to sound like a personal attack or anything of the sort, but I truly have always been curious about humanitarians who reside in the occupied Palestine, which is today unfortunately known as Israel. My question is for Itamar, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the name. Do you personally, as a humanitarian, a member of the legal community, and a very informed one on the topic of refugees and the horrific struggles they go through, do you ever feel at conflict with what you preach by being on land that is taken from its owners uh, who are still being stripped from their homes in the ugliest ways as we speak right now? Again, forgive me if this sounds offensive in any way, but I feel like it is very relevant to the topic and it's very rare for me to be able to have an open and civilized discussion with someone I know is an informed academic who is able to explain to me an approach that I may be unaware of. And finally, if you do feel the conflict, are you working perhaps or on any change or awareness? Thank you very much, um, Lean, for this uh, question. 
I, I want to just uh, remind us all uh, as a preface to this answer that Hannah Arendt was one of the first people who understood that, um, in fact, the founding of the State of Israel reproduced the problem of the refugee as it was um, produced in the interwar period in Europe. Um, just to paint this in very broad, broad strokes, her idea uh, when she wrote about interwar Europe and origins of totalitarianism was that the nation states almost necessarily created displacement for those who did not count as part of the nation state. And she wrote that this re repeated in Palestine where 750,000 Palestinians were displa displaced. And she also referred to the partition between India and Pakistan in the same terms. So in many ways, what she's talking about is very relevant to uh, this place of the wor of, in the world where I'm speaking from. Further, I think that um, the message in the last part of We Refugees, the message to kind of uh, give presence to uh, refugees um, in our political life um, has to do with founding violence, the founding violence of refugees uh, that create such uh, refugees. And indeed, I do feel that uh, um, Israel, in the context of um, its ordinary uh, Orthodox Zionist understanding, um, really does not allow um, for basic equality. And one of the big main problems of this basic equality is the lack of ability to recognize uh, the founding violence and the way it crea uh, created the tore families um, of people who, who still live here and are citizens of this country and um, really um, in a way that never stopped uh, since because displacement continues to this day uh, in many parts of the West Bank and Gaza, of course. And I say in, uh, in parentheticals here that it's striking to be a person working on refugees in a European context coming from Israel and then discovering that so many, or at least a, a certain part of the refugees are indeed generated today um, by Israeli policies, for example, in Gaza. So yes, I do try to address myself to, that, to this situation as well. I don't um, address myself exclusively to situations outside my own country. Um, and I do this by, by way of trying to call for basic civil equality um, that will necessarily transform the nature of this place but I think that transformation will be positive rather than negative. Um, and, um, you know, I, I've written about this academically. I have writing about this academically that has not yet come out. Um, but I also try to practice this in my day-to-day -day life in terms of what I vote for when the elections come, in terms of what I teach in my classroom, and uh, the political message that I try to carry which is a political message that does not, that is in opposition to um, the way that this uh, country has developed over the years, a way that Arendt uh, has identified immediately in the very early 50s. But um, to come back to what Sab uh, Farah said earlier, has not changed much uh, to this very day. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is by uh, Nopes um, Kibiswa. Uh, sorry for uh, any mispronunciations there. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I am Nopes Kibiswa from the Democratic Republic of Congo, very far from where you are, <laughs> but interested in this discussion. And what I'm trying to, it's not really a, a question, but it's a comment to try to, to express uh, what a person uh, can feel. And I understand the situation of Farah Al Faisal, uh, who feels sad. And I was myself a uh, student in the, in the US for about 10 years. And after my studies, I was uh, led to, 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 to be refugee, but I didn't want to, to be refugee. 
because I know what to be refugee is diminishing some, somehow. And I went back to, to my country. But I still struggle because my, my family didn't want to, be, to, go, to go back with me. And now I have to struggle between what I, I want and want, what they want. So it is a problem. But here, my advice is this. Either the one called refugee, either the one called citizen, we need both groups to be, to develop a kind of understanding and not to go to extremes. Because when, when you, 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 you take the language of right as it is taken today by many people, you will go to the extreme right away. And you, you may take guns and start waging war. But if you develop some kind of understanding, tolerance, and try to, to know that in, within the, the so-called refugee groups, you have uh, bad people, as you have bad people in the so-called citizen uh, group. And each one may go far in his or her position, and we will end up in some kind of wars. And that's what I, I would like to just to say, we need to develop some kind of understanding and try to deal with those situations in a way that would help each group to go forward. And I take the situation in, in my country, the Congo, when you have refugees who become stronger than citizens. In the Congo, that's the situation. Refugees have become from Rwanda, from Burundi and from Uganda, have become stronger in the country than citizens. And that will bring people in all we have war, an ending war in, the, in that country. So that's just what I want to, to say. And if I would have an, an opportunity to, to interact more with people, I would like to have co those contacts to continue interacting with people. And my struggle is that I'm, I, I hope you have understood me because I say it in my English. I'm not an English speaker, <laughs> but just I try. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, unless uh, one of the panelists or some of the panelists want to react uh, to that comment, uh, we have one more question. Um, but Itama, you want to say something? No, I just uh, want to say how interesting it was and how important it was to get that perspective that is uh, very uh, critical of the very idea of rights, which is um, a perspective that uh, it's good to keep in mind. And I appreciate the NAUPES uh, and the uh, intervention. Absolutely. Uh, also, a quick remark. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you so much for, uh, for the comments and I want to say that your English was very understandable. English is not my first language e either. So, uh, but I also want to say that I completely understand that um, we are between two fires, whether we want to stay and be refugees or whether we want to go back and live in the struggle that we, that we have in our countries. Uh, some of us don't have that privilege and some of us have that choice. And um, I think that stems from us being able to practice our human rights, which um, sadly, not all of us can do, but I completely understand your struggle and what you said. So thank you so much for your comments. Thank you very much. Um, so one final question uh, from the chat uh, from Marie Walter Franke. Um, thank you very much to all panelists. My question was prompted by Itamar's intervention, but I'd be interested in the thoughts of all of you. In political theory, much of the literature attempting to grasp what is to be a refugee, what it is to be a refugee, boils down to a depiction of a passive, oppressed, deprived group of victims that commence specific moral obligations 
which was rightly criticized here by several perspectives. Several authors, including Baliba, Rancière, Ishin, though propose proactively, uh, provocatively, sorry, to make room for the polit political agency of refugees by proposing to rethink citizenship as a practice rather than a membership, and thus also use the term citizen for anyone politically active through public engagement or through protest or disruption. This, on the other hand, risks masking the very different uh, positionality and risks faced by a person who holds the citizenship and a person who does not when exercising their political agency. Who would like to react uh, to that question? I can say just very quickly, maybe something. Um, I think, uh, uh, Marie Valdo Frank, thank you for being here. Uh, I, we had the opportunity to talk uh, in the past as well. And um, I think that uh, you capture very well something that uh, my, I too have been trying to do in my work, namely to theorize this problem without that prejudice of a kind of uh, humanitarian passive um, image of the refugee as uh, requiring care essentially and not um, acti acting politically. But I, I, I think that um, what you kind of try, try to focus our attention on is the structural hierarchies that exist within the context of a struggle for resources between people who are citizens and people who are refugees. And in my own intervention, I just tried to maybe a little, maybe complicate that a little, a little bit further, saying that certain citizenships um, may be uh, placing one in a, in a, you know, advantaged hierarchical place, but other citizenships are a kind of disadvantage and indeed a kind of prison for the person who holds them. And respectively, while most um, conditions of um, displacement are enormous disadvantages for the, the person who struggles from that perspective, there are very uh, specific conditions in which actually sometimes um, it could uh, be a certain form of advantage. And I've um, emphasized the advantage that can, that can give in particular contexts in which human rights law applies. But I think um, the comment that we heard just previously from now, Chris, also um, complicated the picture in a very interesting way the hierarchical picture in a very interesting way, uh, describing the condition in a context in the global south, um, where maybe also these hierarchies are intermixed in ways that are uh, worth thinking about. Ultimately, um, you know, with all these contexts, if we want to, um, well, I guess I, I'll just li leave it there. Sorry, I, I, I thought of saying some other, some more, but I, I know that we're late, so I'll, I'll leave it there again with a note of thanks. Does someone else want to comment on that? Uh, I don't know if we have time. <laughs> I, I certainly do still have a, a couple of minutes, but it, uh, I don't do not want to stretch. Uh, overstretched the time of those of the others here. Um, okay, well, yeah, I just want to comment on two things, uh, which is the first thing with uh, the, the paternalism uh, practiced on refugees by uh, all the international community, to be, to, to be honest, where we frame them as um, not even professionals on their own situation. Uh, I think it's, it's a fight that we are all going through and whoever is aware of it is trying to change it, mostly in the humanitarian field. Uh, a lot of uh, organizations such as MSF, they took a step forward in uh, not taking the, these extremely horrible, horrifying, sad pictures of children uh, to advertise their work or to uh, get uh, funding. Uh, however, they did take it back and they are posting pictures again, so I'm not sure what's going on in there, but I think there is enough highlight on this image that is unacceptable. And the second thing uh, that I want to say is um, the citizenship and how we treat different people residing on the same land in different ways. I think that's a very big uh, topic that we really cannot cover in, in a few minutes. 
um, but it's, it's a topic of nationalism and the right of blood or the right of land or who has the right to vote or uh, who has any say in what's going on anywhere. So it's a very big topic that we cannot possibly cover in the next five minutes. That is very true. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I think it's, uh, it is now up to me to conclude our fascinating discussion that I have the feeling could go on for two more hours, um, but we are uh, somewhat restricted in these formats. Um, so thank you very much um, to everyone um, who was here today. We have lost uh, really only a handful of participants, even though we went almost half an hour over time, uh, which I think uh, speaks to um, the, the quality of the discussion, the quality of the interventions, um, the quality of your insights, of your answers. I personally found it fascinating and highly beneficial. Um, thank you very much for joining, for participating. Thank you very much uh, to Christian Gudehus, my uh, colleague who is in the background and who had the idea um, for, this, for this event today. Thank you very much uh, to the um, research cluster on um, violence and forced migration at uh, the EFFO at our institute. And thank you very much for uh, the European Society of International Laws. Um, interest group uh, on international human rights. Um, it, was, it was an honor to have you co-sponsor our event. Um, and yeah, it was an honor and a pleasure for me to talk to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope to see you soon, perhaps even in person. Goodbye. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>